Part one. You will hear a conversation between two students. One of them is explaining to the other how to use the university library. First, look at questions one to four. Excuse me, Lily. Could you help me? You know we've got an essay to write about eating customs across the world. Yeah, we have to borrow some books, don't we? Yes, but I missed the library training. Do you think you could show me how to find the books and how to take them out? Sure, no problem. Shall I tell you about the different parts of the library first? Oh yes, thank you very much. Okay then. Let's look at the plan of the library. Here you can see the main door on the north side that leads into the lobby. In the middle of the building, there's a big open PC zone. The lift and stairs are on the left as you go in, and on the other side of the building, there's the library cafe. That part of the library is pretty sociable. It's a good place to study with friends. I really prefer to study alone. Is there anywhere in the library I can go? Oh, if you like studying in a quiet place, it's better to go upstairs to the silent zone. As you come out of the lift or up the stairs, you'll see a section on your right facing north, which is closed off. That's the silent zone. On the other side, facing south, are the bookshelves with all the cookbooks and. Before you hear the next part of the conversation. Look at questions five to ten. Oh, can you show me how to find a book? Well, the library is very big, and the books on food could be under cookery, or they could be in history, or even entertainment. So the first thing to do is to look it up in the online catalogue. Where do I do that? It's easy. There are lots of computers in the library for that. Okay, I see. Right. You look up the title first. When you found the book, you'll see it has a class mark next to it. The class mark is one or two letters and a number. Make a note of the class mark. Then look it up on the plan of the library. The plan shows you exactly what section of the library the books are actually kept in. Thank you very much, Lily. So, how do I borrow a book? That's simple too. When you go to the library, you'll have to take your student ID card. When you want to borrow a book, you take it downstairs to the scanner. Then scan your ID card first. Next, open the book and slide it under the scanner. Until it makes a sound, a short beep, and that's all you have to do. Oh, sorry, I forgot. At the end, the system prints out a ticket. It's a good idea to keep it for a while, just in case you have a problem with your loan. Thanks again, Lily. You've been really kind. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two engineering students, a woman in her sixth year called Linda, and a man in his fifth year called Matthew, discussing the benefits of student work placements. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Hi, Linda. Can you spare a few minutes? Hello, Matthew. No problem. I just wanted to talk to you about temporary work placements. I've never really thought there was a good reason for doing one. I've got some savings, so I don't really need the money at the moment. But I've had an email from the university about a vacancy that looks quite interesting. You did a placement last year, didn't you? I did. Yes. In my case, I wanted to find out if I was making the right career choice before I began applying for permanent jobs. I thought I wanted to work in car manufacturing, but I wasn't sure, so I applied to Toyota. What was the application process like? Lengthy. 
There were a lot of different parts to it. The dullest one was a psychometric test. You know, when you have to answer loads of questions about yourself. And you're trying to guess what's the best thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Then there was an activity that we did in groups, which I found really fascinating. Engineers are renowned for being a bit unsociable, but I thought we made a great team. And we had an individual task, too. We had to sort through various business documents and prioritize them. It was just like what you have to do as a student, really, just with different content. What exactly were you doing on the placement? I was helping to design some diagnostic software to identify any waste in the car assembly process. Do you mean waste of materials? No, time. Anything that can speed the process up helps to cut costs. How did the work placement compare to being a student? Was it hard work? Yes, it was. I'd had full-time work before. I've done various unskilled jobs during university holidays, and some of those involve long hours. So I thought I'd find it easy. I was wrong, though. I think when you're on placement, you're always trying to prove yourself. So you push yourself hard to succeed? Yes. But I got a lot of support from my employers. They were always helpful. And then, at the end of the placement, I was given formal feedback. Do you mean on your engineering ability? Well, no. I didn't really need that because we had team meetings every other day. And so I had the chance to discuss technical issues and ask about anything that wasn't clear. The evaluation was about general workplace things, like organizational ability, initiative, that sort of thing. I get the impression you think you benefited from the placement. Well, the best thing is that they've offered me a job for next year. Depending on my exam results, of course, but still. A permanent one? Yes. But apart from that, I learned so much. The industrial environment was much more demanding than the academic one. So my general skills improved, like time management, meeting deadlines. And on the technical side, I learned new software packages, like MS Project. Well, I think you've convinced me that work placements are worthwhile, but... While you're here, can you give me advice on something else? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. I'm about to make a start on the engineering materials module and I've got a book list here. Can you have a quick look and tell me what you would recommend? That's if you can remember. Let's see. I do remember some of them. Hmm. Yes, this one. The Science of Materials. I found the subject quite hard generally, but this book is very accessible, so it suited me. It doesn't cover everything, though. What about this one, then? Materials Engineering. Oh, yes. I do remember that. But it's a bit out of date now, isn't it? Unless it's a new edition. I don't think so. But what I liked about it were the pictures. They really helped to understand the descriptions. It's useful just from that point of view. Let's see. What else? Oh, yes. That one there. Engineering Basics. I think out of all these, that's got the widest coverage. But I've looked at the contents page and it hardly mentions nanotechnology. Yes, you're right. The evolution of materials does, though. It's a recent publication, so it covers all the latest developments. It's a bit thin on the 1960s, though, and that decade was quite important. Well, it sounds as if they all complement each other in some ways. I don't suppose you can lend me... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between Wolfgang and his new friend Mary, who has already been at the college for a few months. In the first part of the conversation, they're talking about a social activity program at college. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Hi, Wolfgang. Ah, oh, Mary, how are you? Oh, fine. 
How's it going? Have you just had a class? Yes, I just finished my listening class. It was a little bit difficult. Yeah, yeah. It's always difficult when you first arrive somewhere. I found it quite hard when I first arrived. Mm. But you know what really made a difference? Was going on these social activities that the, the college arranges for you. It kind of gives you a chance to practice your English. And、mm. I've heard that the college is pretty good about organising those kinds of things. How do, how do I find out about it? Well, I've just picked up a schedule today. Let's, let's have a look at it. Here it is. What is it? A schedule for, for this week or? Yeah, yeah, let's have a look. Okay, yeah. Maybe we can do some things together, in fact. Yeah, that would be great. So. Let's see. What are they doing tonight? Monday night? Well, they've. So. Oh! They've got singing with guitar. So I went to this last week. It's. Oh, really? Yes, it's quite good fun. Is it pretty good? Yeah, yeah. What do they do? Do they have a concert or. It's. They teach you、um, modern and traditional songs. Hmm, well, I'm not much of a singer, but.、Uh... Oh, come on. You should go. It's really good fun. Well, I suppose it'd be a good way to practice my English. Yeah, because you learn kind of British folk songs and things. It's. Yeah, it's really interesting. Oh, but look at that. That starts at eight. But I notice at nine o'clock there's a, a, a late night coach to Cambridge for a film. I think I'd want to try, go to try that.、Uh, what time does this singing thing finish, do you know? Oh, well, usually it, it kind of lasts about two hours. But I mean, we can always leave earlier. They don't mind. Do. Oh, OK. a y So we can do both then? Yeah, so. Right, so that's at nine o'clock. Yeah, yeah. What movie is it? Let me see. Oh, oh it's Rocky. Have you seen it? Rocky. Rocky? Oh, that's. That's、uh, the one with Richard Dreyfus, isn't it? Richard Dreyfus? No, it's、uh, Sylvester Stallone. Oh, yes, I remember now. American movie. Yes, I haven't seen that. I want to see that. Good, let's go to that. All right. Oh, OK. a y Oh, did you see on Tuesday that there's a tennis tournament? Tennis? Hmm, what time is that? Well, that's at four o'clock in the afternoon. Where is it? Is it on campus or. No, no. It's at w- Wembley, so that's in London. Oh, oh, so that. It's pretty far away then. What time will it be coming back? Um, so it. The coach gets back at midnight. Oh, midnight? Well, hmm. Tell you what. I think maybe I'd better cancel on that because I've got a class Wednesday morning. And I'm afraid. At about 8 30. I'm afraid if I came back that late, I probably would.、Uh, I'd be very tired in class. And actually, I, I'm more into football myself anyway. Oh, football? Well, did you see there's a football match on Wednesday? Oh, yeah. Well, who's, who's playing? Let's see. Oh, it's England and Brazil. Oh, I really want to see that. Would you like to go together? Yeah, sure. What time is it? Let me see. It says 15 30. So that would be 3 30. 3 30, Now, I've got a. I have a lecture、uh, right after lunch on Wednesday at 1 30. Uh huh. What lecture's that? Oh, well, there's a journalist coming from the BBC. He's going to talk about his experiences as a foreign correspondent. Oh, that sounds interesting. Would you, would you like to go? Yeah, what time do you say it was?、Uh, right after lunch, around 1 30. Oh, 1 30. I have a class then. What a sh. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's too bad. Well, what time does your class finish? Finishes, it's an hour long, so it finishes at 2 30. Oh, well, I shouldn't imagine. The lecture shouldn't go much later than that either. So after your class and after my lecture, we can get together to go to the football game. OK, a y so we can meet. Let's see. Maybe 3 o'clock. Or, or maybe 3 15. Yeah, I think 3 15 would be all right. OK. a y Where should we meet? Well, usually these, on these kind of trips, the coach leaves from in front of the dining hall. So maybe we could meet there. OK. a y So in front of the dining hall at 3 15. That sounds fine. Yeah, right. On Thursday, 
There's an international evening in school hall. Yeah, all songs and dances performance by students from all over the world. That's very interesting. Would you like to go and see? Yes, when is it? It will start at 8. Shall we meet at 7.50 in front of the school hall? Fine, 7.50 in front of the school hall. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Oh, and another thing, I definitely want to do this weekend, uh, is to go and see, uh, they're going to have a trip to Stratford on Avon. I think it's on, let me see, what day is that? Friday, I think my roommate told me. Oh, Friday. Would you like to go to that? Yeah, but are you sure it's Friday? I thought that's what he said, but I'm, I might have been mistaken. Well, usually these things are on weekends. Right. Let's see here. Oh, you're right, yeah, Saturday morning, 8.30. Aha. Uh -huh. Right, Friday's the disco. Oh, disco. Yeah. So, actually, I've arranged to go with some of my friends. So, if you'd like to come along with us... Oh, that would be very nice, yeah. Yeah, you can meet some more students. Oh, well, what time... What time shall we go to that, then? Well, it starts at... What time? 8.30, but we don't want to go too early. So let's say 9 or 9.30. Let's say 9.30. OK, yeah, we can meet there, um, but we'd better not stay too late because the Stratford thing is uh, pretty early in the morning. The bus will be leaving at 8.30. Oh, yeah, right. So we want to make sure we get up for that. Yeah. Say, by the way, this trip, um, since it's uh, quite a way away, do we have to pay anything extra for that, or is it free? Hmm. Well, usually most of the trips are free. But, yeah, for these ones which are quite a distance away, then we usually have to pay a, a little bit extra. Is it a lot, or...? No, it's usually about £25, something like that. Oh. Well, do we have to tell them ahead of time that we're going to go? Yeah. Usually you have to sign up a couple of days in advance, so... Oh, where, where do we do that? Um, well, you do that at the student services office. So you have to go and see one of the social activities officers. Oh, so I just tell them that I want to go, and I pay my money and then sign my name. Well, I think I'll go ahead and do that today. Actually, I've got some free time right now. Do you know where I go to do that? Um, yeah, yeah. It's the the student services office. It's just across the road from here. Oh, OK. Um, well, across the kind of... You mean the green building over there? Yeah, yeah. So it's on the second floor. Oh, OK. Well, tell you what, um, are you going to the Shakespeare thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Would you like me to go ahead and sign you up as well? Oh, yes, yeah. That would be great. But, well, I haven't got any money on me at the moment. Oh, don't worry about the money. That's fine. You can pay me back this evening. I'll go and sign us now. And then when I meet you tonight at the singing, you can, er, uh, give me the money then. Oh, well, if, if you are sure, that would be great. No, it's no problem. OK. Oh, is that the time? I'd better go. I've got a class. I'll be late. OK, sorry. I'll see you later then. All right. See you tonight. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You're going to listen to a talk about tea in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. During the 1930s, there was a popular song which had the title Everything Stops for Tea, and to millions of British people, a restful cuppa is still an ideal way to relax for a few minutes from the rigours of the day. The English custom of drinking tea has its roots in the 17th and 18th centuries. When first imported to Britain, 
The exotic ch, cha or cha, as the Chinese tea was variously called, was considered a man's drink to be enjoyed with colleagues at London coffee shops. These were popular meeting places for many walks of life, politicians, lawyers, poets, actors and writers. Many London clubs began in this manner, and the famous Lloyd's Insurance underwriters started out as Lloyd's Coffee House. In 1706, the first coffee house that offered tea was Tom's Coffee House, owned by Thomas Twining. He realised that he needed to introduce an added attraction to compete with the many other coffee houses in London, and tea was rare, exotic and extremely expensive. With these credentials, tea became an exclusive drink and enabled Twining to open a tea shop under the sign of the Golden Lion in the Strand. By the 18th century, the ladies of the more affluent classes were going China mad, using tea as an excuse for displaying their extravagant purchases of Chinese porcelain and Dresden tea sets. A comprehensive tea tray would consist of a teapot and stand, teacups and saucers, sugar bowl, milk jug and basin for discarded tea and tea leaves. Tea was still expensive and kept in locked tea caddies. Skilled craftsmen fashioned caddies of carved inlaid woods fitted with crystal and precious metals. To ensure the servants weren't tempted by this priceless commodity, the caddy was kept locked and only the mistress of the house held the key and prepared tea when guests came to visit. No well-brought-up young Englishwoman could consider herself socially acceptable unless she knew how to brew a proper cup of tea. As the 18th century progressed, changes in commerce and working hours resulted in the main meal of the day being taken much later in the evening. The prospect of lasting from breakfast until evening did not appeal to the Duchess of Bedford, who is usually credited with being the first to alleviate late afternoon hunger pangs by introducing a small four o'clock meal served with tea. With time, the light, wafer-thin toast or delicate white bread gave way to exotic fillings like tomato and egg, cucumber, chicken or potted shrimps, followed by buttered scones, crumpets or elegant pastries. The popularity of tea continued to spread, but it was not until 1839 that the first shipment of Assam tea, Indian tea was landed in Britain. A healthy trade with India was soon established, and tea clippers, like the Cutty Sark, now a museum in a dry dock at Greenwich, were reaching the peak of their sailing days. In 1879, the first limited shipments of Ceylon tea began to arrive, and by 1880, this had been firmly established alongside Indian and China teas, giving the broad range of teas that are available today. There have been few changes in three centuries of tea trading. London is still the centre, and indeed Twining still has a shop on the site of the original Tom's Coffee House at 216 The Strand. The name Twining has been linked with tea for over 280 years. Indeed, it was Richard Twining, in his capacity as chairman of the dealers of tea, who in 1784 persuaded Prime Minister William Pitt to reduce the high tax on tea, making the beverage more accessible to the general public. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.